Uh, thank you, Raj. Uh, it's really exciting to be here. Every time I come to India, I'm uh, really excited uh, about it. It's, it. As Raj says, I started out working, you know, actually I was a farm worker when I was small. I, was, I began supporting myself at about 12 years old as a farm worker, uh, harvesting crops, uh, and eventually became a, a, a construction worker, a telephone lineman, not an operator, the guy who puts cable up on telephone poles uh, in Hawaii, which is my home. Uh, and so, having done all that, whenever I traveled in rural India and I see farmers, I actually feel some connection to them. You know, because farmers all over the world do the same thing. They work in the soil. So, uh, in India, I always feel that sense of connection. And, and I come here often, and uh, I, each time I land here, I feel a sense of excitement to come to your country. So, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me here. Uh, I want to say, just to s spend one second talking about what Raj brought up, is that we were sitting in a coffee shop in Hong Kong talking about this university when it was no more than a dream. Uh, there was no uh, piece of land on the corner of, of, of uh, Delhi, no, uh, there's nothing, it was just an idea. And talking about what it would take to build a world-class university uh, in, in a developing country, uh, in particular India, that's where Roger's from, but I know his heart is with developing countries in general, because I, I, he and I have worked together a lot. Uh, and so the idea of doing this is such an amazing thing. And so when I come here, and it, all the bricks and mortar is in place, but the people are here too. You know, it's like that movie, you know, where they said you, you build a baseball diamond and they will come. Well, Raj uh, and his colleagues and yourself build a university and they come. They're here. And the funny thing about it, it's like a new thing. But both Raj and I have attended Harvard at one or other times in our life. And you walk on that campus and you see a statue of John Harvard there in the middle of the campus. And you realize, you know, he was just a guy too. And he built a campus and they came. It just, the only distinction was it was a couple hundred years earlier. So whether there's a statue of O.P. Jindal or, or even Raj Kumar, or someone here a couple hundred years from now uh, showing what happened and whether anybody notices will depend on you. It depends on what you make out of your experience here in this university. So it's really exciting. I, it's one of the most exciting. I actually bubble over about it all the time when I'm talking to my friends around the world. I travel a lot. Just that there's this university and there's a bunch of people like yourself sitting here and it's going to be what you make of it. It, you, you, trust me, life doesn't get much more exciting. So uh, congratulations on this, and, and I wish you all the luck uh, as I've been watching this very carefully. Okay, what I want to talk about today is, the, in a sense, the relationship between constitutionalism or human rights and constitutionalism and development, and it's also its relationship to culture. I teach a course on constitutionalism in emerging states. So I'm kind of concerned with what we might call emerging states, just how important is constitutionalism to it, okay? So that's sort of the essence of what, of what I want to talk about. Uh, it, we're not alone in this concern. If you look up there, you'll notice I put a few things down in this first slide uh, that domestic governance is really more and more of interest to international institutions and so on. And we know in India, the word governance comes up all the time. So how to improve governance, how to make it work. Now I'm going to talk about East Asia today, and I'll use some reference to what I call indigenization, okay? So I'm going to suggest that there are, there's room for difference in different places. I think fundamentals have to be there, but there's room for difference. So the essay is not going to be on India. It's going to be on East Asia and the peculiar characteristics of these de rapidly developing countries in East Asia, okay? Now, you guys know about them because one of them is right across the border from you, right? And occasionally a bit of trouble over that border and a bit of trouble or competition with that country. Uh, when I wrote it recently, 
uh, review of Raj Kumar's book on corruption, I, I said it was a little book with the world on its shoulders because India is a kind of example of a democracy trying to develop. And China sort of represents the other example of an authoritarian regime trying to do the same thing. So I think here in India we should have an interest in East Asia. And there's probably something we can take home from the Asian, East Asian experience for India, and we can bring that up in discussion. But I'm not particularly writing on, in, uh, talking about India. So if, if to the extent that I, I, what's useful, I guess it would be because if we think constitutionalism matters, then we'd probably care also that India's constitutional system was working well, okay? And we would focus on things like governance, corruption, and so on. So there's some lesson, but, but again, I'm not, it's not the central focus. But it is an important focus of the world at large. This focus on governance, in fact, I think especially gained attention after 9-11. And, and we, you'll recall that that happened in the early part of, of this millennium. And then uh, there was something called the Millennium Development Goals. And in 2005, there was a World Summit where they were going to reflect on how well we were doing with development that development outlined in the Millennium Development Goals. And I noticed one thing that was really interesting that came out of that, and it was reflected in the title of a report prepared by the UN Secretary General, then Kofi Annan, uh, called In Larger Freedom Toward Development, Security, and Human Rights. And why I bring this up here just to start to, as a tease for our topic is because to me it's interesting that now development, security, and human rights are put together. Up until very recently, a lot of times development was discussed more in terms of almost like charity, that other rich countries should help poor countries. But what you see in this title, in the second uh, bullet point here, is that the rich countries as well are now appreciating that their own security depends on development around the world. So now it's a self-interested task. And I think in some sense that elevated it. And that was even emphasized more by the idea of responsibility to protect, which was also embodied in the World Summit outcome. Okay? And it's saying that in effect if countries failed to protect their people, and, and a lot of the protection would relate to their development, problems of poverty, and associated problems of violence and discord that go with it, if countries couldn't take care of that, that other countries would become involved because now security of everyone is at issue. It's not just you're becoming involved because of the CNN effect, that you see it on the news and you think, oh God, these poor people, we should help them. But it's your, your own interest. And I kind of like that move as a kid who was out scrabbling for a living at age 12, I never really liked charity that much. I always found it a bit demeaning of people. So how we deal with our problems of governance is first and foremost our own problem. It's something that we have to pay attention to. And, and I like the idea that it's something that if others are interested, they recognize that they're not all Mother Teresa, but rather they're people who have self-interest. And I like that. I actually would rather someone help me out who's self-interested rather than, you know, looking down on poor me and giving me something. So I kind of like all of these moves that we saw here. And what I argue in, my, uh, in a paper that goes with this, this presentation today, uh, and it's actually that paper is in your, your journal. It's, what is it, the International Affairs Journal? Yeah, it's in your Journal of International Affairs. That's why we chose this topic. It's in the inaugural issue there, that, that paper. And what I argue there is that the, the thing that most captures that is constitutionalism. That constitutionalism is this word. In fact, I, some of my European students in Hong Kong said, gee, I never even heard of the word constitutionalism until I came here. But here in Asia, we hear this word, right? It's the kind of, it sort of makes constitutional law dynamic and interdisciplinary by assigning uh, this uh, term. 
Okay? So that's important. In the paper, I now focusing more sharply on East Asia, I ha it's really, it really comes in two parts. In the first part, I address the, the claims of exceptionalism from human rights in East Asia. Recall that East Asia is pro probably more than any other place, the place who gave us this other vocabulary, Asian values. Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore, now later Jiang Zemin in China, invoked this idea of Asian values. We see it everywhere, but in East Asia, I think it took on life of its own and became very significant. So what about culture? Is culture an obstacle to constitutionalism? Obviously, the founders in India didn't think so, right? Beginning the Congress, beginning in the 1920s, already envisioning a constitutionalism for India. So I don't think India has gotten bogged down so much in whether constitutionalism is good or bad. They're more focused on how to make it work, right? What, what could work for India? And in East Asia, the Asian values debate had a, a, another component, and that was the so-called economic miracle. And the economic miracle argued that authoritarianism produced the miracle. Thus, I was saying Raj Kumar's book has the world on its shoulders because the Chinese model juxtaposed against the Indian model, which one is going to produce the greatest success? And unfortunately, most of us are a little more than worried that the Chinese one is doing better. And so we have to assess whether that's where, where the world is headed. Are we all becoming China? Or is there an argument to be made for democracy and human rights? And what I, the argument I make is a constitutionalism argument. In the second part of the paper, I discuss constitutionalism uh, as involving three elements, in particular, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Strangely, all three of them are human rights, human rights, and human rights, because democracy is a human right. The rule of law brings us human rights. So de democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And to this, I add indigenization as a fourth element. And I'm going to argue, and the paper discusses, how well constitutionalism responds to this culture claim, cultural exceptionalism, not unknown to this part of Asia as well, okay? and how well it responds to our development concerns. Is it the vehicle where we want to invest our development efforts? Okay. So that's what the paper is going to do. You can see here, I just have a slide to summarize what we've talked about, uh, sort of the over, overarching argument that we're going to talk about. And I'll just take, you can take a quick look at it there. And then go on to start taking up the parts of the argument. What about culture? In the, in the article in your journal, I essentially have a threefold critique of the Asian values cultural argument, okay? Uh, the Asian values argument seems to say that Asian societies are inherently more authoritarian and anti-democratic. In fact, Sam Huntington famously characterized uh, Asians in, in the way you see here. Asians favor, he says, authority over liberty. It's really talking about East Asians. East Asians, it might read, favor authority over liberty, the group over the individual, and harmony and cooperation over open political debate. It's interesting in China, the word harmony is used a lot nowadays. Uh, and is it a harmony of allowing us all to speak and reach consensus, or is it a harmony of silencing us? And that's sort of India versus China. When you get out of the airport in India, you can almost hear the debate. You know, the hubbub, what's going on, okay? In China, nowadays, there's a joke among dissidents. When you get arrested for speaking your mind, they say you have been harmonized. You know, it's become a verb. So, harmony. Uh, dis I say this is discredited on a number of, in a number of ways in, in, the, in the essay that you have. It's discredited to the extent that authoritarian leaders are using it because it's mostly just self-serving. They're justifying their own rule. So a self-serving uh, characteristic uh, discredits it. 
Uh, and it, empirically, a number of scholars rebut the claim that somehow Asian culture, East Asian culture, and we're talking mostly Confucian societies, are, is somehow hostile to uh, modern democratic values and human dignity and so on. And uh, this, here today we don't have time to go at length. There's a bit more on it in, in, the, in the reading you have in your journal. But uh, these scholars look back at Confucian values and find that Confucianism also has a robust concern uh, with fundamental values like the golden rule, that you treat people fairly and equally, okay? And also Confucian uh, scholars were admonished not to serve a bad leader. They were hardly Democrats, but we're talking, you know, 2,000 years ago. So we don't expect them to be Democrats yet. The Greeks weren't Democrats either much, although they had some uh, village democracy. Uh, and so, there, and then a, a final uh, argument to discredit it is the kind of uh, notion that you had to, uh, in effect, you had to cert satisfy certain prerequisites before you could have democracy. And this is item B here that I talk about. And the prerequisites argument says that societies aren't ready for democracy until they have something called civic culture. And that this civic culture had to be developed first, and then you would have democracy. Now this argument has also been discredited. As you see here, the word often used is that it's tautological. That how do you develop democratic civic culture without democracy? Now, most democracies in the world didn't sit around taking opinion polls to see if the societies in question passed the democracy test. And the East Asian societies did not either. When you go and look around in East Asia at the new democracies in Korea, in Taiwan, uh, and even some in Southeast Asia, sometimes in Thailand and in Indonesia and so on, almost none of them would pass a democracy test if you gave it to them for civic culture. And certainly this society we're in today, in India, God knows almost everybody on the planet would say the democracy that was established in India 50 years ago satisfied no test in terms of education levels, civic culture of any kind. So it doesn't seem that telling people they have to pass a test, they have to have prerequisites, is a sufficient answer. Although we would say, and I would say about India, that when you want to consolidate democracy and improve democracy, yes, you may want to encourage things that would, we would call civic culture, better education for people, uh, maybe uh, inculcate values of human rights and tolerance and so on. So we want to improve our democracy, but we call that consolidation. And then finally, the last cultural challenge that I want to identify is what I call the communitarian challenge. Here, uh, there's, there's several kinds of branches of this. It comes out of what we call the liberal communitarian debate, which is a debate between a kind of liberal individualistic society versus a communitarian society. Uh, and one angle of the debate is what I call romanticization of community. The Vietnamese village, for example, was described as anchored to the soil at the dawn of history. You know? And so this idea of romanticizing traditional society. And the rebuttal to that is probably that most people don't, didn't find traditional society that romantic. I mean, a lot of villages are poor, difficult places and not very guarding of freedoms and human rights that you might value. And that explains why our cities keep growing. So the romanticization is fine. We romanticize and highlight our traditions and values. But when we use that as an excuse to deny democ democracy and human rights, then we probably cross the line. Another argument in East Asia is what they call civic virtue. That is, you want this uh, leader, you, you want to create you want to choose leaders, Lee Kuan Yew being the style, you know, the Singaporean leader, 
these very virtuous leaders, uh, an emphasis on that, while democracy seems to do the opposite. In democracy, we are kind of aiming to make society safe for the unvirtuous leader. A democracy wants to survive at George Bush. You know, they want to survive probably any number of leaders you guys could mention in India, you know, that a democracy would somehow survive that. So whether uh, the virtuous leader is the ideal we want to strive for, uh, again, is in question. And then finally, a kind of communitarian argument, uh, which has some truth, that we do want to encourage and engage groups as well as individuals and so on. So uh, East Asia uh, promotes this idea as well, but I don't think it bars democracy. The economic miracle is the other side of the East Asian debate, okay? And here, uh, the, uh, basically, this invokes why did East Asia grow so successfully? We know that more than any part of the world, East Asia has had dr dramatic economic growth. And some societies that were very poor at the end of World War II are very rich today. So there is some success. Uh, and the model was especially that of Japan, what we call export-led growth. It involved, as I, I note here on the slide, micro uh, state planning of industrial development to foster rapid developmental takeoff. So that's sort of the way it's described. Uh, so the state government gets involved in targeting and guiding industry. It tends to repress labor. And it was symbolic of the very dramatic growth models of Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, and today China. It, it argues that this kind of authoritarian guided leadership will lead to stability, predictability, uh, and a developmentally oriented political elite. So this is the consequence of uh, such a model. What I argue here is that authoritarian success becomes its own great digger. While in the early stages of development, authoritarian regimes actually enjoy greater success because if, if the leadership is as they want it to be, virtuous enough and not too corrupt, then it can mobilize forces to achieve economic development. And the society at that stage is usually very poor and the workers not too demanding. They basically are happy as they are in China, 180 180 million workers in what's called the floating population willing to travel from the farm, as they do in India as well, to the cities to get jobs at very low wages. The problem, why it becomes its own grave digger, is the stability it can achieve with a very compliant workforce evaporates in time as the society becomes richer and more and more demands are made. And in effect, the authoritarian regime becomes overloaded. So it may not just be uh, what we plan for the society, but it can actually be that we really have no choice. As the society becomes more complex, more and more demands will be made for change. And this is what we saw in East Asia, and what tended to push these societies towards uh, democratic reform. And so we have a masses movement in Korea, similar movements in Taiwan, and yet rapid economic development, and an emerging middle class, and eventually the social complexity pushes the society towards reform. The $50 million question today, the elephant in the room, is will China defy gravity? Is China somehow the exception? It's going to manage to keep an authoritarian regime in power in spite of its rapid economic development? And that's a question we don't know the answer to yet, but there have been articles written on with literally that title, Will China Defy Gravity? Will it somehow resist the reform process that seems to emerge uh, very quickly as the society becomes richer? Okay. So here you'll see I also talked about the financial crisis in East Asia of the late 90s and noted uh, that societies with better developed uh, constitutional systems seem to do better. Although China was not harmed, 
because China's currency was not freely traded and it was not directly affected by the financial crisis. Some in East Asia have said, aha, I know, in fact, Chinese scholars have said, I know what we can do. Let's have the rule of law with authoritarianism. Let's just go halfway there. Let's be safe. Let's not have dramatic reform, but just improve the rule of law. And Guillermo O'Donnell, a famous Latin American scholar, pointed out the problem with this argument is to how do you have the rule of law without democracy? Is the rule of law connected to democracy? Is democracy essential? And O'Donnell says, the problem is, is the dictator is unable to make himself unable to intervene whenever it's expedient. So a dictator really has a hard time maintaining the rule of law. So as a consequence of this, I basically draw a link between constitutionalism as a way to respond to these uh, critiques uh, and a way forward. And here I talk about the ingredients of constitutionalism, human rights, the rule of law, and democracy, plus indigenization. And I say that this has three aspects. First is political empowerment. Uh, so political empowerment, often you and I will think of constitutionalism, we think we use words like checks and balances, constraints. What I want to argue is that constitutionalism isn't just a constraint. It's an empowering dimension. If we view it as a constraint only, then the new leaders may tend to say, ha ha, we, have an, we can wind up with an elected dictator like a Boris Yeltsin, that we elect, I've been elected, you judges have not. I'm not going to be constrained by you because I'm serving the people, they chose me. And the response to this, also offered by O'Donnell, is he characterizes this, this kind of elected leader as a Caesaristic, plebiscitarian executive. That is democracy without constitutionalism. He's, and what I would argue is by doing that, he fails to appreciate that democracy requires constitutionalism. It requires a vehicle for empowering the people. And constitutionalism is not just a constraint. It's an enfranchising element. It empowers people. And then the second area where I think we want to pay attention to constitutionalism is in constitution making and ongoing implementation. How is it empowering? Constitution drafting at founding moments, whether it's in India or in East Asia, tends to be a very highly active time when many people are mobilized. So not always, but in most cases, it follows a revolution or the overthrow of colonialism. So the idea of empowerment is quite evident when people sit down to draft constitutions. Now, there will be constraints. Uh, John Elster describes upstream and downstream constraints. Upstream, it may be the founders, when they set up a constitutional convention, will be very clear about what they want. And so when people meet to draft a constitution, will they follow these constraints? And downstream constraints may relate to ratification or some kind of process to approve a constitution. But in either case, I think you have this vision uh, of a very active moment where people are in power. And you have constitution making in East Asia really going on big time in the last two decades in across East Asia, Korea, Mongolia, the Philippines, Indonesia, Taiwan, Taiwan and Thailand, uh, and so on. So there's a lot of action there. Another way that constitutionalism is empowering is in implementation. What is judicial review? You're about, many of you here may be lawyers, and you're thinking constitutional review. Is that, again, just constraint? Or is constitutional review a process of, in light of engagement? Is it part of a living constitution? So empowerment can occur again as people pass laws, judges review them, 
people pass new laws, and the conversation goes on and on. So I would say ordinary constitutional implementation through the judiciary is also empowering and not just constraining. And then finally, I would like to say a third way which constitutional implementation empowers people is in what we call constitutional politics, or Bruce Ackerman at Yale would call constitutional moments. There are times when people get up on the stage and clear their voice and say, I have a dream. And people are listening to you and you say, does he really mean it? And obviously, I have a dream is Martin Luther King. Is he, is Martin saying this is a constitutional moment? Constitutional politics, we want to mobilize more of all of the people. So again, empowerment. It's not just lawyers and judges. Sometimes it's the people at large who speak. In fact, Bruce Ackerman argued that the United States was not just one republic founded by George Washington, but three republics. From the founding of Washington and Jefferson and Madison to the Civil War, and then a new republic after Lincoln's engagement in the Civil War, going into the 1930s, and then finally a new republic from the 1930s forward. So you have dramatic changes, without, sometimes without changing a, a, a comma. In the 1930s, nothing was done to the American Constitution. So what is the social contract with people, and when do they change it? When are they mo mobilized to change it? I would say these things are what allows political culture to evolve. If people are empowered and engaged, then you can talk about uh, political culture. And I would say these things also allow for the stability and engagement of the public. That's the goal not simply constraint. And finally, I talk about indigenization here, and I just want to say that I think every constitution, including the one in India, is indigenous and has indigenous components. I don't care where they got the, the, the text, what they borrowed, what they wrote. The American constitution is highly shaped by American political culture. You know, I, I generally want to say that's not that. This is not a full cultural relativist argument, which many dictators in East Asia make, that, you know, it's hostile, constitutional democracy is not good for our culture. But rather, it's saying that if the fundamentals are there, Aung San Suu Kyi said this. She says, as long as there are fundamentals, there's room for local institutional embodiment. So a living constitution will take on peculiar character of the society that it's in. Uh, and as long as there's certain fundamental commitments, that's probably a good thing. Uh, we wouldn't want to uh, say that every country has to be the same. At the same time, we don't want to create exceptions so that some people are forced to live under repression and not empowered to engage in their society. So, my conclusion, you'll see here, sort of summarizing it, authoritarianism, I say, represents a poor solution in plans for continued economic development in East Asia, that broad public engagement in constitutional democracy is central to cultural discourse and economic development, that constitutionalism affords the fundamental institutional components for addressing cultural and development interests, and it supplies a venue for securing the order, reliability, and participation to mediating crisis and ongoing development, and that indigenous conditions will impinge greatly on any democratic reform process. There's no one-size-fits-all. These considerations represent the intersection of development and human rights in the modern democratic project. So this is a summary of it. We can discuss it. Now we've got plenty of time, I understand, at least a half an hour. Uh, and if there are questions or comments, and we can see if this has any application to India, how we might apply it in India. And I commend the article to you if you want to get more details, because this is a very abbreviated account. So thank you.